Guys, your subscription will really help in promoting my channel, and this will motivate me to improve content. If you like the video, you can subscribe to the channel and rate the video, thus helping me and my channel a lot. Thank you for understanding. I was finally moving out of my parents' house at the age of 21, excited to start my new life in my home place. My room was in the attic, and it was always a bit stuffy up there, but it was my sanctuary. As I was packing up my belongings, I came across a box labelled electronics that was filled with old gadgets and wires. As I rummaged through the box, I found an old VCR player with a stack of tapes next to it. Curious, I picked up the tapes and read the dates inscribed on them. They were from a long time ago, spanning over a decade. I had a sudden urge to watch them. But before I could even press play, my father walked up the stairs and saw what I was doing. He yelled at me to stop and said that I didn't want to know what was on those tapes. His sudden outburst piqued my curiosity even more. After my father left, I continued packing my things, but my mind kept wandering back to the tapes. I couldn't shake off the feeling that there was something important on them that my father didn't want me to see. Finally, I decided to give in to my curiosity and watch the tape with the oldest date. The date read September 19th, 2003. I popped the tape in the VCR, and it started playing. At first, it showed my grandmother opening birthday presents. I smiled at the sight of her, remembering how kind she was to me when I was a child. But then the tape cut to something entirely different. Someone was recording my grandmother sleeping, and it was silent other than the heavy breathing behind the camera. My grandmother woke up and asked, Is everything milk Jack? Jack was my father's name. He then said, why did you try and take my kids from me? My heart raced as I listened to their conversation. My father was schizophrenic at the time, and my grandmother just thought it was another scenario made up in his mind. She tried to calm him down, but that only made him more angry. He wrapped his large hands around her throat, and dark crimson blood came out of her mouth. It went silent, and he had forgotten about the tape, so it just stayed there, staring at her white corpse covered in blood. I was horrified by what I saw and heard. My father had killed my grandmother, and I had no idea. I knew I had to do something about it, but I didn't know what. I called the police because I wasn't sure if I could trust that if he found out, he wouldn't do the same to me. The police arrived at our house, and I showed them the tape. They arrested my father and took him away. The news of my grandmother's murder shook our family and the community. It was a tragedy that no one expected, and it left a deep scar on us all. In the aftermath, I struggled with my emotions. I felt betrayed by my father and guilty for not knowing what he was capable of. But I also felt relieved that I had found out the truth and could prevent any further harm from happening. My grandmother's death taught me the importance of being aware of the people around me and the importance of mental health. In conclusion, what started as a simple move out of my parents' house turned into a life-changing event. I uncovered a dark secret that had been hidden from me for years, and it shook me to my core. But it also made me stronger and more aware of the world around me. Sometimes the truth can be painful, but it's better than living in ignorance. My opinion? I think the main character did the right thing in calling the police. After all, the father could have had the same aggression again soon after, and then people would have been hurt again. All in all, the story is quite creepy and frightening. It was supposed to be a weekend of celebration, as my father's birthday was coming up, and my uncle was visiting. But things took a dark turn as soon as my uncle arrived. He was acting strange, almost like someone was impersonating him. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but it made me uneasy. On the day of my father's party, my mother sent me to the bakery in town to pick up the cake. As I drove, everything seemed normal, except for the baker. He was a family friend, but he was acting nervous and kept apologizing for no apparent reason. I brushed it off and continued on my way, 
but then my truck hit a nail in the road. I had to pull over to change the tire. And that's when I saw that the nail was covered in blood and part of the pavement was stuck to it. It looked like it had been placed there intentionally to slow someone down. After changing the tire, I drove home in the pouring rain. When I arrived, I saw that my uncle's car wasn't in the driveway. I walked into the house with the cake in hand, only to find both my parents impaled with hundreds of rusty nails. The sight was horrific, and I dropped the cake as my body went limp. I checked their pulses, but it was clear that they were already dead. It was like someone they trusted had attacked them suddenly, without giving them a chance to defend themselves. I called the police immediately, and they arrived within minutes. My little sister was found crying and bloody in the attic. She told the police everything she saw, and I was placed in her care, as that was the only blood relative who was fit to take care of her. The next few years were a struggle. My sister and I had to cope with the trauma of losing our parents, and I had to learn how to take care of her as a young adult. We moved to a new town, hoping to start over. But the past was never far behind. A few years later, the police found my uncle's body in a river. It was clear that he had been murdered, and the cameras nearby showed his doppelganger pushing him into the stream. It was a shocking revelation, and it made me wonder how many other people might be walking around with an evil twin. The experience taught me to always be aware of my surroundings and to trust my instincts, even if I couldn't explain why. And most importantly, it taught me the value of family and how important it is to stick together in the face of tragedy. My opinion. It's a very sad story to lose your parents so abruptly, and even on your birthday. The main character cannot be blamed for what happened, because he could not help his family. He was far away from them when it happened, but a friend of their family definitely knew something. The old mansion on the hill was a place of mystery, and no one knew what secrets it held. It had been abandoned for years, and the only sounds that could be heard were the creaking of the old wooden doors and the howling of the wind. The locals whispered that it was haunted, and that the ghost of the previous owner still roamed the halls. One night, a group of teenagers decided to explore the mansion and uncover the truth. They were bored and looking for some excitement, and breaking into the old mansion seemed like the perfect adventure. They climbed up the overgrown path that led to the mansion and snuck in through a broken window. As they entered, the teenagers felt a chill run down their spines. The air was thick with dust and cobwebs covered the walls. They cautiously made their way through the dark hallways, trying not to make a sound. Suddenly, they found themselves in a grand ballroom. The ballroom was massive, and it was the most beautiful room they had ever seen. But it was also eerie, and the air was filled with an ominous presence. As they looked around, the doors at the end of the ballroom creaked open, and a figure emerged from the darkness. The figure was wearing a tattered dress, and its face was shrouded in darkness. The teenagers froze in terror, but the figure didn't seem to notice them. It walked slowly towards the center of the room, where a grand piano stood. The figure sat down at the piano and began to play a haunting melody. The teenagers were transfixed by the music, but as the melody continued, they began to feel strange. The notes seemed to be coming from inside their heads, and they could feel their minds being pulled in different directions. As the music reached a crescendo, the teenagers screamed in horror as they realized they were no longer in control of their own bodies. Something had taken over, and they were being forced to dance to the music, their limbs moving in unnatural ways. The figure at the piano continued to play, its face still obscured by shadows. The teenagers knew they had to escape, but their bodies wouldn't respond. They were trapped in the mansion, at the mercy of the vengeful ghost who had claimed it as her own. Hours passed, and the music continued to play. The teenagers were exhausted and afraid, but they couldn't stop dancing. They could hear the ghost laughter echoing through the halls, and it sent shivers down their spines. As dawn broke, the music finally stopped, and the teenagers collapsed to the ground. They were bruised and battered, but they were alive. They knew they had to leave the mansion before the ghost returned. 
As they stumbled towards the exit, they could hear the ghosts whisper in their ears. They promised that they would never leave and that they would be trapped in the mansion forever. The teenagers finally made it out of the mansion and ran down the hill, never looking back. From that day on, they were never the same. They were haunted by the ghost whispers and they could never escape the memories of that fateful night. And so, the mansion on the hill remained haunted, its halls filled with the desperate cries of those who had dared to enter. The ghost of the previous owner had finally found the companionship she had been denied in life, and she would continue to play her eerie melodies for eternity. My opinion. The story of the haunted mansion on the hill teaches us to be careful when exploring the unknown. It reminds us that there are things beyond our understanding and that we should always approach them with caution. It also serves as a warning that our curiosity can lead us down dangerous paths if we're not careful. Alora sat in her car, feeling nervous and anxious. She was on her way to a house party, a gathering of her so-called friends, she couldn't shake off the thought that everyone around her was just pretending to like her out of pity. She was convinced that they all hated her and invited her to things only to be polite. Her friend Imogen had insisted that she attend her birthday party, saying that it wouldn't be the same without her. Alora didn't understand why Imogen was so adamant about her coming, but she couldn't say no to her. She put on the outfit Imogen had suggested, hoping to avoid embarrassing her. As she arrived at the party, her panic meter went off the charts. There were already multiple cars parked outside, and Alora knew that there would be people there that she didn't know. She braced herself for the inevitable scorn and judgment that would be directed at her. But as she stepped inside, Imogen greeted her with a huge smile and pulled her into a tight hug. The other guests cheered and raised their drinks, welcoming her. Alora couldn't believe it. Maybe... They really did like her after all. She made her way to the dining room, where a variety of dishes were laid out. Imogen had even made special vegetarian dishes just for her. Alora was touched by the gesture and made herself a plate. But before she could even take a few bites, Imogen appeared again, insisting that she join her and a few others in the basement for a game. Alora felt a sinking feeling in her stomach. She knew that Imogen and her friends liked to play some strange and twisted games, but she had never been interested in participating. Still, she didn't want to disappoint Imogen on her birthday, so she followed her down the dark stairs. As they reached the basement, Alora's worst fears were confirmed. There were seven people shackled to the wall, and Imogen handed her a skinning knife. She explained that it was her birthday, and she got first pick. But as a special thank you, she wanted Alora to make the first cut. Alora was horrified. She had never been into cannibalism, and the thought of cutting into someone's flesh made her sick to her stomach. But she didn't want to upset Imogen, so she reluctantly picked a man who reminded her of her ex. As she made the first cut, Alora felt a surge of adrenaline. It wasn't the killing that bothered her, it was the fact that she was doing it with people who enjoyed it so much. She couldn't understand why they found it entertaining to torture and eat other humans. But as the night wore on, Alora began to feel a strange sense of belonging. She was being included in a group of people who shared her darkest desires. And for the first time, she felt accepted. She started to let go of her insecurities and embrace her true self. As the party ended and Alora made her way home, she couldn't help but feel conflicted. On one hand, she was grateful to have found a group of people who accepted her for who she was. On the other hand, she couldn't shake off the feeling that what they were doing was wrong and twisted. In the days that followed, Alora struggled to come to terms with her newfound sense of belonging. She knew that what they were doing was illegal and immoral, but she couldn't deny the rush she felt when she was with them. She wondered if she could ever truly be happy without them. In the end, Alora made a choice. She decided to embrace her true self and continued to participate in the twisted games with her new friends. She knew that what they were doing was wrong. My opinion. It's hard to say anything, it's just that these people are crazy. 
The main character discovered her inner desire and started doing it all the time. When I was growing up, my dad used to tell me about a terrifying experience his father had when he was a child. My dad never remembered the story well enough to tell me, but he warned me not to ask my grandfather about it because it still scared him. However, one night when my grandfather had had a few beers, we were sitting around telling ghost stories, and I convinced him to finally tell me what happened. He said he had only ever told a handful of people and would only tell it once. He began by telling me that when he was around 10 to 12 years old, he lived in a small village outside of town where he went to school. Every Friday night, he would go to an elderly woman's house to help her with her garden and do small jobs around the house. She didn't have any family or children, so my grandfather and his parents looked after her. One Friday night, my grandfather got off the bus and headed to the old lady's house. He unlocked the shed and got the old push lawnmower out to do the grass. As he was working, he looked into the living room window and saw the old lady smiling and waving at him. After finishing the grass, my grandfather put everything away and knocked on the door to collect his pay. The old lady slid the money and a hard sweet out of the mail flap on the door and said, Sorry, I'm not feeling too well, but here is your money. My grandfather thanked her and left. When he returned home, his mother and father were sitting in the kitchen. They told him to take a seat and said, We have something to tell you, but you probably already know. The old lady we look after died this morning, so you won't have been paid. My grandfather was confused and told them they were wrong because he had just spoken to her and seen her through the window. His parents didn't believe him until he pulled out the money and hard sweet from his pocket. They all freaked out and went to the house, where they found all the doors and windows locked and no one inside. As they were walking away, my grandfather turned around and there she was, standing in the doorway, waving at him. Nobody believed him and he was so scared and confused. He shouted, I know I spoke to her, I definitely saw her, but to this day he still won't look at the house she lived in, in case she is standing there waving. Hearing this story sent chills down my spine. The idea of seeing someone who had already passed away was terrifying. I couldn't imagine what my grandfather must have felt at that moment. From that day on, I made a promise to myself that I would never ask my grandfather about the story again. I didn't want to put him through any more pain or fear. It was a memory that he would have to live with for the rest of his life, and I didn't want to make it any harder for him. As I got older, I often thought about that story and wondered if there was any truth to it. Was it possible that my grandfather had actually seen and spoken to a ghost? Or was it just his imagination playing tricks on him? Either way, I knew that the memory of that experience would stay with him forever, just as it had stayed with me. And although it was a frightening story, it was also a reminder that there are still many mysteries in this world that we may never fully understand. My opinion. This story teaches me that there are things in this world that are beyond our understanding, and sometimes it's better not to question them. It's also a reminder to always trust our own experiences and perceptions, even if they may be dismissed by others. Sarah had always been intrigued by the supernatural, and when she heard rumours about Mystic Manor, she knew she had to investigate. She packed her bags and headed out, eager to uncover the truth about the town that only appeared once a year. As she arrived at the nearby motel, she could feel her heart pounding with excitement. She knew that the next day would be her chance to explore the town and uncover its secrets. She went to bed, eager for the morning to come. When Sarah arrived at Mystic Manor, she was amazed by the festive atmosphere. The town was alive with music and laughter, and people were having a great time. But as she looked around, she could sense that something wasn't quite right. The children in the town seemed to be behaving oddly, almost as if they were under some kind of spell. The townspeople were pale and dressed in old-fashioned clothes, and Sarah felt as though she had stepped back in time. She decided to investigate further. As she walked around the town, 
Sarah noticed that the outskirts of Mystic Manor were shrouded in darkness. She could hear strange noises and see shadows moving around her. She felt a sense of dread as she realized that the town was disappearing before her very eyes. Sarah knew she had to get out of there, and she ran to her car. But as she turned the key in the ignition, she saw the town was right in front of her. She tried to back away, but it was too late. Mystic Manor had claimed another victim. As she stood there, paralyzed with fear, a figure emerged from the darkness. It was Jebediah Crosby, the man who ran the town. He looked sinister, and his hollow voice echoed through the air. He claimed that he needed the souls of his visitors to keep Mystic Manor alive. Sarah could feel him draining her energy, leaving her feeling weak and helpless. She knew she was going to die, and there was nothing she could do to stop it. The next morning, Sarah's body was found lying in the middle of the road. She was lifeless, drained of all her energy. The people of Mystic Manor had claimed another victim, and the curse of the town continued. Over the years, many people had tried to break the curse of Mystic Manor, but no one had ever succeeded. The town continued to appear every fourth Sunday of July, drawing in unsuspecting victims that it fed on before disappearing once again. Sarah's death was just one of many, and the people of Mystic Manor continued to feed on the souls of their visitors, absorbing their energy and leaving them lifeless shells. The town had become a place of darkness and despair, a place where the living dared not tread. And so the curse of Mystic Manor continued, as the town appeared every fourth Sunday of July, drawing in new victims and leaving behind a trail of death and destruction. It seemed as though there was no way to break the curse, and the people of Mystic Manor would continue to feed on the souls of their visitors for eternity. My opinion. The story of Mystic Manor is a cautionary tale about the dangers of blindly following tradition and the consequences of ignoring warning signs. It reminds us to trust our instincts and investigate our surroundings before diving headfirst into unfamiliar territory. I was a 22-year-old college student named Emily, living in a large old house that had been passed down through my family for generations. My parents had decided to go on a weekend trip, leaving me to take care of the house and our two cats. At first, I was excited to have the house to myself. I had plans to catch up on my schoolwork and enjoy some alone time. But as the night wore on, the house seemed to grow colder and darker. I tried to distract myself with my work, but every little sound made me jump. I convinced myself that it was just my imagination, that the house was just settling, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. It was around midnight when I heard the first sound coming from upstairs. It was a soft creak, but it made my heart race. I paused, listening for a moment, and then continued working, trying to convince myself that it was nothing. But then I heard it again, a soft shuffling sound, like someone was moving around upstairs. My heart pounded in my chest as I tried to come up with a rational explanation for what I was hearing. As I sat there frozen, trying to figure out what to do next, the noise grew louder. It sounded like footsteps now, slow and deliberate, as if someone was purposely trying to make noise. I knew that I was the only one in the house, and that's when the fear really set in. I tried to calm myself down. Then I heard the footsteps again, closer this time, and I knew that something was wrong. I slowly got up from my desk and made my way to the staircase, my heart pounding in my chest. As I climbed the stairs, I tried to tell myself that it was just my imagination, that I was being silly, but the fear wouldn't go away. When I reached the top of the stairs, I saw a figure moving the shadows. It was tall and thin, with long fingers that seemed to stretch out towards me. I froze, not sure what to do, and then the figure turned towards me. That's when I saw it, or rather, the lack of it. Its face was just a blank, featureless void. I screamed and ran back down the stairs, my heart racing. As I reached the bottom of the stairs, I heard the figure following me. Its footsteps were louder now, and it was moving faster. I knew that I had to get out of there, but my keys were upstairs, and I was trapped. 
The figure drew closer, and I could see that it was holding something in its hand. It was a knife, ginting in the dim light. I thought that it was the end for me, that I was about to be killed by some unknown intruder. But then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, the figure vanished. I stood there, shaking with fear and confusion. I didn't know what had just happened, but I knew that I never wanted to be alone in that house again. I grabbed my keys and ran out of the house, tears streaming down my face. I called my parents, and they came home early from their trip. They didn't believe me at first, but when they saw how shaken up I was, they knew that something had happened. We called the police, but they didn't find any evidence of an intruder or anything suspicious. To this day, I still don't know what happened that night. Was it just my imagination? Or was there really something in the house with me? All I know is that I never felt safe in that house again, and I made sure to never stay there alone. My opinion. The story is really creepy. I think the main character went to check out that place by herself for nothing. The best way would have been to wait it out somehow, or call her friends, parents and discuss what's best to do. In any case, it's good that everyone is safe. I was excited to start my new job, driving one of their vehicles with a mounted 360 camera system. It was a unique job that required me to record highways, streets, and even off-beaten paths in the middle of nowhere. I was assigned a company car, and I worked alone, which could be lonely, but I enjoyed the adventures that came with the job. The pay was fantastic, around $7,000 a month before taxes, and they covered my gas, hotel, and food expenses. But unfortunately, as a 1099 employee, I didn't receive any benefits. My car was my office, and I worked five 10-hour days each week, driving for hours without any human interaction. The job was straightforward, but it required a lot of multitasking, as I had a computer inside the car. I had to navigate the roads and manipulate the camera system mounted on the roof. One day, I found myself in a small town north of Marysville, K which had a peaceful countryside vibe. As I was finishing up my shift before the weekend, I decided to take a shortcut down a dirt road that I thought would connect to the highway. It was a decision less soon regretted. It was still 5 p.m. and the sun was out, but the heavy foliage and overgrown trees made the road dark and eerie. It felt like I was in a horror movie. I had to turn on my headlights just to see where I was going. As I made a sharp turn on a downhill slope, I saw my headlights reflect off a yellow dead-end sign. Fortunately, there was enough room for me to safely do a U-turn. This part of the road was the darkest area of the forest, with only small patches of sunlight penetrating through the canopy of trees. But as I was about to leave, I looked in my rearview mirror and saw someone standing behind the dead-end sign. It was a kid, about 13 years old, with a bowl-cut hairstyle and raggedy dark clothes. His face was pale, and he had a distant stare that felt like it was locked onto me. He didn't move or make a sound. I felt compelled to check on him, so I rolled down my window and reversed my car closer to where he was standing. But when I parked my car, he didn't come over to my window, and when I looked back in my rearview mirror, he was gone. I couldn't even hear any footsteps or the sound of twigs snapping. If he had left, he must have been a trained ninja. The forest was eerily silent, except for the sound of my car engine. I slowly drove away, feeling scared and uneasy. But as I came within 100 yards of the main road, I saw the same kid walking about 50 yards in front of me, his back facing me. It was possible that it wasn't the same kid, but the dark clothes, Raggedy jeans and physical stature were the same as the one from earlier. He walked away from the forest and onto the main road heading eastbound. I waited until he was out of sight before driving the opposite direction. I was so scared that I didn't even bother to check the rearview mirror. I put my foot on the accelerator and drove as fast as I could, feeling like my life depended on it. But as soon as I got back to the office, I reviewed the footage from my camera which recorded 360 panoramic photographs 
while the car was in motion. I was sure the kid would be captured in one of the images, but to my surprise, there was nothing. No kid, no shadow, not even a silhouette of a person. My opinion? The story as a whole is really creepy to be in a dark forest, and also to meet with Kamita ghosts or strange forest children. But I don't think you should have opened the window or tried to go out to meet the silhouette in the woods. It could have ended badly.